This is the 2018 Lamborghini Huracan Performante, and it is everything a Lamborghini should be. It has insane performance numbers. There's this crazy, low-slung, exotic car styling. It's massively expensive, and that name, Lamborghini Huracan Performante, you can't get away with naming a car like that if you're Buick. Basically, it is the Lamborghini of Lamborghinis, and today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this Huracan Performante from Lamborghini Newport Beach here in Southern California, which is Lamborghini heaven. They seem to have just about everything, including two Performantes right now. So what exactly is a Performante? Well, here's the deal. The Lamborghini Huracan is the entry-level Lamborghini. It starts around $200,000. It has 600 horsepower, and it's one of the best exotic cars I've ever driven. The Performante is sort of the next level, more thrilling, performance version of the Huracan. It starts around $275,000. It has 630 horsepower, and it's 90 pounds lighter than the regular Huracan. So basically, if the Huracan is a crazy Lamborghini, this is a crazy, crazy Lamborghini. And today, I'm going to review it. First, I'm going to show you around the Performante, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and cool features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Performante, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've compiled a list of some performance versions of exotic cars that are currently listed for sale on Auto Trader. Now I'm going to start the quirks and features with the interior of the Performante. And before I do that, I want to mention I have reviewed the regular Huracan before, but it was a long time ago before I really went all in depth on the quirks and features. I don't even really remember all that much what I covered. Nonetheless, I'm going to link that in the description below if you want to see my take on the regular one. And with that in mind, we must start with the hexagon. Now, I covered this in my review of the Lamborghini Urus, but it seems that Lamborghini is obsessed with hexagons. And so when you get inside this car, and it's the Huracan specifically, you will see hexagons on just about every surface. Now, some of them are very obvious. The center of the steering wheel, for example, has a hexagon in it. The climate control vents are all hexagons. The rear view mirrors on the outside of the car, those are hexagon shaped. The control for the rear view mirrors on the door panel, that is shaped like a hexagon. And frankly, there's even hexagon trim on the dashboard in this car. Are, literal hexagons just there for decoration. So there are some obvious hexagons, but there are also some hexagons that you gotta give them credit for because they really went out of their way and found spots to sort of hide hexagons you won't notice unless you're really looking. For instance, the start stop button has a little lid over it. That lid is shaped like a hexagon, pretty cool. But if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a little window inside that lid, which is also shaped like a hexagon. So you have a hexagon in a hexagon. How about the fact that the drive mode display on the bottom of the steering wheel, Stratosport Corsa, that is a hexagon. Looks like a regular display, but it isn't. They tricked you. And it goes further than that. Take a look at the transmission selector. The park and manual buttons are square. There's four sides, but printed on top of them are hexagons. You know their supplier was like, nah, we, we can't do hexagons. We got to make them square. And Lamborghini was like, well, can you put hexagons on the squares? And so they did. And it gets even crazier than that. When you're sitting in the passenger seat, on the door panel, there is just a random hexagon pointed at you. It has no function, it has no purpose, it's just there. Now, I guess in right-hand drive Huracan models, that is the power mirror control. Usually, most automakers cover that up or do something a little different on the door panel, but Lambo was like, no, no. We'll just remove the mirror controls and leave the hexagon so they know. My favorite hidden hexagon, though, is on the outside of the car on the fuel door. The fuel door itself is not a hexagon, but the little tiny tab where you're supposed to put your thumb to open the fuel door is a hexagon. They just thought of everything. During the design process for this car, they must have been like, well, can we make that a hexagon? Now, you may be wondering, why all the hexagons? The story that was told to me is that six signs corresponds with carbon, which is the sixth element. And obviously, carbon is very light, and this car has a lot of carbon fiber. And so the hexagons and carbon fiber are supposed to tie into each other. I don't know if that's true. It sounds kind of ridiculous. But either way, this car is all about hexagons, both hidden and obvious. 
Now, moving on from the hexagons to the other interesting quirks and features, I want to go back to that start-stop button and its cover. Now, the start-stop button situation in this car is very cool. You get in, you flip up the cover, you press the start-stop button. It's like how I imagine starting a fighter jet would be. Now, the interesting thing about that is you can see there's a little window in the start-stop button. Like I mentioned, it's shaped like a hexagon. Apparently, the early Lamborghinis with this flip-up cover, people were getting mad because every time I get my Lamborghini, I gotta flip a thing and then push a button. It's so much work. People actually complained about this. So Lamborghini put a little window in the cover so you don't actually have to flip up the cover. You can just stick your finger through the window to start the car in case you're too lazy to flip the cover to your start stop button in your Lamborghini. Next, I want to talk about shifting into gear because that's another unusual thing. Now, you can see if you look below the start stop button, you have R, P, and M. Now, R is on this like hoop over P and M. That's how you stick this car in reverse. You pull up on R and then you're in reverse. It's kind of a cool little thing. Now, below that you have P and M. P is obviously for park. If you wanna put it in park, you press that. And M is for manual mode. So you're wondering, well, where's D? How do we put it in drive? Well, it turns out to put it in drive, all you gotta do is squeeze on the right paddle, the upshift paddle, which is of course on the steering column, and then you're in drive. No need to fiddle with anything down here. Next up, moving on to the center control stack, actually above the center control stack, there's a little screen up there that shows you oil pressure, oil temperature, and battery, except all of those things are written in Italian. Now, the cost to convert that to the language of every market where this car was sold in would have been minuscule, but Lamborghini gets away with it because they're like, well, this is an Italian car, and so it's our culture, and so they save a little money. Don't have to make those in Turkish and Russian and English. Can you imagine if Toyota did that? If on their oil pressure gauge, they're like, oh, it's in Japanese. We're a Japanese company, so we're gonna put it in Japanese. It's part of our heritage. So Toyota could never get away with it, but Lamborghini can. Next up, still in the middle, I wanna mention one interesting item I found is the world's tiniest armrest. Most cars have an armrest that's like a foot long and sort of goes from the transmission selector to the seats. Well, not this thing. In this one, it's like four inches long and it appears to only be for a tiny elbow. Interestingly, it actually works. When you're driving down the road, you just lay your elbow on that and it works out. And speaking of incredibly tiny things, we now have to talk about the sun visors. The sun visors are really small. They're only like two inches high. I don't know if they'll actually shield you from the sun. But to me, that isn't the most interesting thing about them. The most interesting thing about them is that they come forward. In most cars, obviously, the sun visor tucks up toward you and then you pull it down the opposite direction of this car where it comes forward that is kind of an interesting quirk of the Huracan. Now next up we move on to the center control stack and another interesting quirk of the Huracan and that would be there are seven switches up here and they control various different things the power windows turn off traction control your hazard lights your parking sensors fine the weird thing is there is a blank switch. Now, I often complain about blank switches in expensive cars. I think if you pay enough, you shouldn't have any blank switches, but this is a different case because in this case, Lamborghini went to the trouble of creating one of these switches and the little plastic piece it sits in and the little hoops around it, and yet it doesn't do anything. You can't move it up or down. It has no function. So there is a blank switch, but it has to be like the most expensive blank switch in the entire history of the car industry. Next up, you'll notice if you look around this interior, there is no cup holder in the Huracan, which of course is by design. This is a driver's vehicle, and so you don't need a cup holder. You shouldn't be drinking while you drive. This should be enjoying the road. Not quite. Actually, there's a cup holder hidden. Go back over to that hexagon trim on the dashboard, and there's a little cup icon. You push it, and a cup holder is hidden in there, and it pops out so you could put a drink in there. And that is really kind of a cool little touch. Take the drink away, push it back in, and no one would ever know that there's a cup holder in there. Cool hiding place, Lamborghini. Now, next we move on to the steering wheel, and specifically the turn signal. Now, in cars like this, high performance, upscale, expensive sports cars, there's been a movement in the last few years to get everything sort of onto the steering wheel so the driver doesn't even have to move their hands off the steering wheel when they want to put on the wipers, the headlights, the turn signals. And so the turn signals in this car are not a stock coming off the steering column like in every other car. Instead, they're mounted on the steering wheel. And check out how they work. If you want to make a left turn, you flip this switch to the left and the left turn signal turns on. When I make a right turn, same deal, switch it to the right. So you're wondering, well, how do you cancel it if you're just making a lane change? You don't push it back over to the left or right. Instead, you push it in. Now, I was driving this car around, and I got to admit, this is weird for the first 15 minutes. But after that, you're like, you know, why aren't all cars like this? 
Now, right above the turn signal, you can see there's a little light button. That's to flash the brights at someone. The actual headlights are over to the left of the steering wheel, and of course, they're automatic. But if you just want to flash your brights at someone, if they're coming toward you, they don't have their headlights on, you can do that easily on the steering wheel. Now, beyond that, over on the right side of the steering wheel, you have your wipers, and that operates in very much the same way that the turn signals do. It's a little switch. You want more wipers, you move it to the right. You want less wipers, you move it to the left. And right above that, you have the Lamborghini windshield washer mounted on your steering wheel. And since we've all wanted to see what a Lamborghini windshield washer looks like, take a look. Now, the other interesting thing in the steering wheel is the drive mode button, which is in the bottom in the center of the wheel. You have three drive modes to choose from, Strada, which is just street, regular, sport, and then Corsa, which is track, race. And you can switch through them with that little red toggle switch on the bottom. Now, when you switch through them, you can hear changes in the exhaust, but to me, the coolest thing is what happens in the gauge cluster. All right, so you're in Strada, and here's like the normal Huracan gauge cluster. It looks fairly normal. You move it into sport, and I like the fact that a couple things turn orange, and that's pretty much the difference between Strata and Sport in the Huracan. But check this out. You move it into Corsa, and look what happens. The entire thing is totally transformed to like a track gauge cluster setup. Now the tachometer is huge, the gear you're in is huge, and there's a G-meter on the bottom. It is one of the coolest gauge cluster displays in the entire car industry. It really looks like you're in a fighter jet or a video game or something like that. Now beyond that, there are a couple of other interesting items in the gauge cluster. This car has no center touch screen like a lot of vehicles. Instead, your entire center screen situation is right there in the gauge cluster, and that includes your navigation map. So the navigation map sits right there next to your tachometer tachometer and your speedometer so you're driving along and you have all of that right in your field of vision. It goes along with sort of the driver focused ethos that puts the turn signals on the steering wheel. Your radio's on there etc. Now interestingly there are a couple of interesting items inside the gauge cluster and some interesting settings. In order to go into the menu for the gauge cluster you press menu in the center control stack and then it brings up the menu which is of course several icons arranged in a hexagon. I would expect nothing less. Now one of my favorite items inside the menu screens is in the car menu and the parking aid. Now a lot of cars give you the opportunity to turn the volume of parking aid up or down so if you want your front parking sensor to be very loud you can do that whatever. This car also lets you change the frequency and so the result of that is when you go into the parking sensors thing and you change the frequency you can play a little song. Take a listen to mine. Now, I know I already showed you that in the Volkswagen Golf R, and this is all the Volkswagen Group, so it's probably the same hardware, but I just think there's something more ridiculous about it happening in a Lamborghini. Our next interesting gauge cluster item is in the stereo settings. You go in there and you can change the balance, basically where the music is pointed in the cabin. If you want it on the left side, the right side, further back, whatever. That's pretty common. The weird thing in this one is the little icon that shows where it's most directed is, of course, shaped like a hexagon. I would expect from nothing less in the Huracan. Now, next up, we move on to the time zones where you can pick your time zone. And frankly, it's kind of an interesting little geography lesson. It displays four cities that are in each time zone, which is very useful. The one I think is odd, though, is you go into Eastern Time, and the cities they've chosen are Toronto, makes sense, DC, makes sense, Havana, and Lima. So Miami's not on there, New York's not on there. <laughs> Those are probably two of Lamborghini's biggest markets, but hey, Lima is on there, so don't worry, all is well. Now, next up, we move back to the center control stack in the Performante. The second switch from the left controls the front axle lifter. Now, a lot of high-end sports cars have this now. They're all so low that if you want to go into driveway, you might scrape, so you press the front axle lifter, and then the front end pops up a couple of inches, which allows you clearance over driveways and speed bumps and anything else you might have to clear if you're actually going to use this fairly frequently. That is a good idea, and it's offered on most of these exotic sports cars. Offered, I say, because it doesn't come standard. Instead, this is a window sticker right here. That was a $6,900 option. $6,900. In fact, this car has quite a few options. I calculated them to be a total of $38,000 in options, bringing the original price from $274 all the way up to $312 and change which is a lot of money and options. Some of the options are obviously very expensive, the axle lifter, but also the navigation system is $4,100. I once bought kind of a crappy BMW M3 for not much more than $4,100. The cost 
of a mere navigation system in the Lamborghini Huracan. Now, my favorite option, the best deal, that would be the one entitled Travel and Smoker which is only 600 bucks, travel and smoke are just 600 bucks. So what does that get you? Well, it gets you a cigarette lighter mounted in the center console here in the back so that you can smoke your cigarettes. But then you're wondering, well, there's no ashtray. So where do you drop your cigarette butts? Ah, but there is. Behind the angled center console, there is a little space back there. You wouldn't really know about it, it's sort of hidden. And in that space, there is a little ashtray. It's like a portable ashtray in like a cup and it's Lamborghini branded. And so if you get that option, you have a cigarette lighter and a Lamborghini ashtray for only 600 bucks. Seems like a deal. Now, next up, we move on to the outside of the Performante. I'm gonna start with the wing, which is like the most striking visual detail. It is fixed and it's far larger than the small little adjustable wing on the regular Huracan. A couple of things stand out to me about the wing. One is the finish. Instead of this like very careful, perfect carbon fiber weave, you have this sort of daring bare carbon fiber look that I think looks really good. It's rare that you see this look on the outside of a car, but Lamborghini has chose to finish the wing in this trim and it's a really cool look to me. Now, next up, we move on to the rest of the rear of the Huracan. There are a couple of things that I think are worth pointing out back here. One is right below the wing, the next thing down, you have this honeycomb pattern back here for heat dissipation. It won't surprise you to see that all of those little honeycomb things are hexagons because of course they are. Now, right below that, right in the middle of the rear of this car, you have the exhaust. It is massive and it's right in the middle, but the look of the exhaust has nothing on the sound. I'm gonna let you listen to the car first in regular mode and then in race mode, which is insane. All right, here's regular. <laughs> Okay, that frankly sounds pretty good, but now here's race. And that sounds amazing. Frankly, it's one of the best exhaust notes of any exotic sports car in the industry. And one of the things I like about the back of this car, when you look back here, it looks like the license plate is just a complete afterthought. You have the exhaust in the middle and the honeycomb in the middle, and then the license plate looks like it's just sort of tacked on there in the bottom like they forgot about it. And I love sports cars where that's the case, where it looks like the license plate was forgotten during the design process. I can just imagine a designer going, okay, I have finished with my Lamborghini. Oh, wait. What do you mean? I, I need a license plate? A license plate? For what? People are going to take my work of art on the road? Oh, fine, I'll put one on just for them. I'm not sure what country the designer is from, but nonetheless, I really like that that looks like just sort of something they put on last because they had to. Now, another interesting item that I find rather unusual in this car is the door handle. Now, you can see right now it's sitting here and it's just sort of flush with the sign and the door of the car, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, as you walk up here, you can tell, well, first off, it's shaped like a hexagon, because of course it is. And in order to open the door, you push the front part, which, by the way, is also shaped like a hexagon, because of course it is. And then the back part comes out so you can open it, and then you pull it, and the door is open. It's actually a fairly simple design, and when the doors are closed and the door handle is just flush, it looks a lot cooler than a normal hoop door handle like your car might have. Next up, another cool feature on the outside of this car is the headlights. Now, when you're just driving along, the running lights are very cool. They make this sort of cool Y shape in the front. There's two of them in each headlight cluster. But when you put on the turn signals, look at this, the turn signal sort of takes over the place of the running lights in the same Y pattern. It is a very cool and very distinctive look. And it's the same story in back. The rear taillights and turn signals also carry on that Y shape that you saw up front. And when they're illuminated or when they're flashing, they look kind of cool. And it's even the same story inside where the Performante's unique ultra crazy grippy tight bucket seats also carry that Y shape. There's one Y on the bottom and there's another Y on the backrest which sort of carries in the exterior design into the interior and of course it looks pretty cool. And next we move on to the engine bay and there's nothing particularly crazy or quirky or unusual back here except for the fact that it's painted gold but it is always nice to gaze at a mid-mounted Lamborghini engine, in this case a V10, making 630 horsepower. That is a cool look, no matter how many of these I drive. Next up, two other rather interesting quirks. One is the fuel door. You press the aforementioned hexagon to open it right up, and you can see it's a fairly standard fuel door, fuel tank situation. But there is one interesting item, and that would be the little sticker on the hinge. 
Well, this car takes unleaded fuel, and most cars say unleaded fuel only. This thing has a gas pump with the letters PB crossed out. That's because PB is the chemical symbol for lead, so it's crossed out, so it's supposed to be no lead, unleaded fuel. It's kind of a leap. I'm not sure if anybody really realizes that's what that means, or if anybody has actually tried to put leaded fuel in this thing, but it's interesting to see that. Finally, one other cool item in this car is the key. Now, the key for the most part just looks like a fairly normal luxury car key, but I love how at the very end when they could just taper it off in the chrome and make it stop, instead they sort of have it jut out again, and at the very base of the key you have the Lamborghini crest with the bull logo on it. They don't have to do that, but it adds to the coolness of the key dramatically, and I think it really makes it look nice. So that's a tour of the Lamborghini Huracan Performante. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Huracan Performante. First thing you notice, these seats really grip you. They're really tight. Uh, I don't consider myself a very big guy. I've just sat in a lot of these GT3 sport seat things. These are about as tight as any ones I've ever been in. This thing hauls. It is impossible to overstate the precision of the steering in a Lamborghini Huracan. Um, 488 is a damn good car, but this thing is so sharp. It's just absolutely amazing how sharp the steering is and how connected it is. And the moment you even think I want to change lanes and just start, to, you're there. Uh, it. it <laughs> I can't imagine automotive steering getting sharper than in this car. Wow. The speed is just absolutely incredible because the thing is, the speed with the regular Huracan was already absolutely incredible, and now we have this, which is even more amazing. I will say the ride comfort is atrocious. Not only is the seat incredibly tight and, and, and huggy, uh, it's also hard. Now, the seat being a bucket seat means there's less material, so you're a little lower, so you have a little bit more headroom. And I fit just fine, and I'm 6'4", it's no problem. The problem is, because it's a hard seat, it hurt, you know, you're not getting a lot of padding when you're sitting on it, but also, I mean, the comfort of the car, this thing, you go over the lane line bumps and boy, can you feel it. And because it's a wedge shape, the ceiling, the roof kind of comes all the way forward. And so visibility up is actually a challenge. I'm sitting here like this and I can barely see the headlights um, I'm sorry, I mean the traffic lights. I'm a little distracted because there's a Citroen Traction Avant next to me. I have no idea why. <laughs> this is uh, Southern California. Now sitting here stopped, I have to admit, it feels pretty good. It feels like an Audi. I mean, all the materials are nice. It's not, it's not shaking like an older Lambo or something like that. Probably would be. Um, the, the climate control is blowing on me like I feel like I'm sitting in a nice car, like a nice luxury car. The auto response is just amazing. Not only is the car tremendously fast, but you just tap it a little bit and boom, you start to go. There's no, you know, fear, there's no lag, there's no delay. Uh, obviously the car's zero to 60 number speaks for itself. There obviously can't be a delay if it's putting down those kind of numbers. I love touching the steering wheel. It's nice and thick with the uh, Alcantara. It, it, this is exactly how a steering wheel should be. It feels right, it feels perfect to hand, it's perfect to touch. And so that's the Lamborghini Huracan Performante. I'll put it simply, this thing is amazing. No, you wouldn't want to use it every day, but for trek days and weekend fun, it's practically unrivaled. I've always been a Ferrari fan over Lamborghini, always, basically since birth. But the simple truth is that the Huracan drives better than the Ferrari 488, and the Performante drives best of all for track days and weekend fun. It is the ultimate entry-level Lamborghini, and now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Performante looks wonderful, striking, but not necessarily beautiful since it's mostly just an angry wedge shape, it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is like 2 point something seconds and it gets a 10 out of 10. Handling is incredibly, insanely sharp and it gets a 10 out of 10, becoming just the fourth car to do so after the Porsche 918 Spyder, the Carrera GT, and the new Ford GT. It deserves it. Fun factor is strong, it's a blast to drive and it gets a 9 out of 10. Cool factor is also strong, it's a special car obviously, 
especially in one that will always turn heads, it gets an 8 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 45 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. It's fine, good for a car like this, it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, however, is rough. Between the harsh ride and the tight seats, it gets merely a 3 out of 10. Quality is strong, the interior is beautiful with top quality materials everywhere. Potential reliability is the only reason why it gets knocked down a bit to an 8 out of 10. Practicality is weak, of course. The trunk is small, it's hard to drive anywhere, there are only two seats, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Value is fine, it's a lot of car, even for the money, but it isn't a better value than a regular Huracan. It's $75,000 more for only incremental performance increases, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 25 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 70 out of 100, and you can see where it falls. The Performante is an amazing car, and it beats the regular Huracan by one point in the weekend categories, along with the McLaren 720s and the Ferrari 488, but it loses to the regular Huracan by two points in the daily categories. One is for comfort, and the other is for value. The Performante is an amazing car, but I think I'd rather save my money and get a regular Huracan, which is almost the exact same thrill. Oh, and yes, I know it's pronounced Citroen Traction Avant, not Avant, so I don't need four million tweets declaring it so. Sitting in the passenger seat over on the door panel, there is just a random hexagon on the door panel pointed at you. <laughs> what do you mean? It needs a license plate? A license plate? Well, that will ruin the design, the perfect design. Um, I'll fine, I'll put it on just for the people who are going to need to drive it on the road. And then they do that. I think this, this guy's Irish, I'm not sure. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> Now, next up, we move back into the center control stack here in the Performante. One of these switches controls the front. La la la, I don't know what I'm doing.